Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today. It may be a small panel with participants and a few more people, but we hope to get a few more views on live stream. Unfortunately, many people in Armenia could not join because of the last three days events, starting on the fighting in Nagorno-Karabakh, starting on early morning on Sunday, but uh, still uh, we expect uh, some more audiences to view this video. And I'm the Vice President of the Center for Policy Studies in Yerevan, I'm in Yerevan, and we have partners from ESGA in Romania and Latvian Institute of International Affairs joining us. And today also I'm happy that uh, Miroslav Savis from Globset so Latvia could join as an ex expert. So, we may have a fruitful discussion. Miroslav wrote several publications on related to the topic of our today's event or not our program. One of the latest ones, I believe, was one together with Peter Kreko, creating a health info scheme in Central Europe and beyond, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe something more recent have been there as well. So I would like to pass the floor to Miroslava now for her presentation. Thank you very much for the introduction, Arman, and thank you so much for also this invitation. Um, so I'm going to share my screen, um, but I believe um, the host will need to do that if you could enable me. Because I can't hear. Ah, okay, it works now. Brilliant. So I'm sharing the screen now. Can everybody see my screen? Do you see? It? Uh, yes, yes. Brilliant, thank you. So my name is Miroslava Sawiris, um, and as Armen said, I work as a research fellow for Globsec Policy Institute and I work within the program of democracy and resilience. And we are primarily concerned with how um, digital age impacts the resilience of democracies. So we do a lot of research and awareness raising around phenomena such as you know, disinformation, spread of conspiracy theories, um, influence operations carried out by foreign state or non-state actors, as well as domestic actors. And we're also very much interested in, in um, finding out the vulnerabilities of general populations and seeing how these vulnerabilities can be sort of um, lessened and, and building up the resilience of, of the audiences and building up uh, the information security in, in the digital age. So, in my presentation, um, I will basically divide it into, let's say, two, two parts. I'd like to speak a bit about um, very prevalent pandemic disinformation and harmful narratives, not necessarily just disinformation, but also um, some of the most prominent narratives which are now circulating um, in Central Europe and Western Balkans as we speak. Um, and then I would like to present a brief case study on what is the civil society actually doing in Slovakia and, and in Czech Republic um, in terms of trying to, trying to um, create a better information environment and trying to react to, to the infodemic. So um, I'm just going to make a, a few key points um, in, terms of these, uh, in terms of these harmful narratives that we are seeing. Basically, in CEE and, and in the Western, Western Balkans, we are seeing similar disinformation or conspiracy narratives um, to what is perhaps being spread also in the Western Europe and also in the USA. So there are certainly similarities, but there are also, I would say, specific twists whereby these narratives are kind of tailored to, to the audiences and to the relevant socio-political and historical circumstances of that particular area. 
Um, so these narratives that I'm going to be talking about are some that we have collected from our partnering organizations in, in the region. And so we don't have their prevalence tested yet. As we speak now, public opinion poll surveys are basically being conducted and this will give us a chance to, to test the prevalence of these narratives or basically to see you know, the extent to which what people read online is then reflected backwards in their, in their beliefs. And this, this uh, report should hopefully be coming out in, in December 2020. So let me just um, dive right in. A uh, very popular narrative, um, which I don't know whether also you've come across um, in your respective countries, is a, is a narrative that, that puts a new spin on the migration threat. So it's migration as a threat in relation to COVID-19 by way of claiming that um, it is migrants, you know, from Africa or, or from wherever who are basic, basically importing COVID to our countries. So this narrative is popular in Poland, it's popular in Hungary. And again, you know, it's because Central Europe is, um, is a region we, where anti-migration sentiment is very strong. So this narrative has been quite popular also in Slovakia at the beginning, um, at the beginning of, of the pandemic, let's say in February. And the reason why is also that it's, um, it's, it's, this narrative has been very well, let's say, nurtured by all sorts of um, problematic actors online, as well as by some political agendas. And then this COVID-19 as a conspiracy theory narrative, it's being increasingly, it's gaining prominence. And I can say that from the perspective of Slovakia, you know, and also Central Europe, where we could say that the first way of the pandemic has been handled very well not just because of the, let's say, draconic restrictive measures that has been put in place, but also because the populations were quite disciplined about conforming to, to these restrictive measures. But right now, um, the COVID-19 as a conspiracy narrative is becoming very prominent and is joined with the anti face mask movement, which we also see in the US, in the UK, and basically all over the world. And basically it argues, you know, that the pandemic is not real, or at least that the numbers are exaggerated to, to profit different actors, whether it be state institutions or, or pharmacological companies most often. So this narrative is gaining prominence, as I've mentioned, in Bulgaria, Romania, and Slovakia in particular. I'm not saying that it isn't present elsewhere, but this is what our partners and what we think, um, you know, is a prominent narrative in these respective countries at the, at the moment. And um, we also believe that it's kind of linked to the propensity of certain audiences to believe in specific conspiracy theories. So for example, we have um, a data on, on the prominence of the new world order conspiracy theory and Bulgaria, Romania and Slovakia are, are countries where this narrative and this conspiracy theory is quite popular, but I'll, I'll talk about it um, in the next slide. But I just want to say that this narrative also has different sort of spins. So in Romania, you know, the COVID as, uh, as a hoax basically is linked to George Soros, uh, or, you know, they claim that he had a role in the pandemic's inception, whereas in, for example, in Slovakia, Bill Gates is being blamed. So he's sort of taking over the role of, of, the, of, of the bad guy at the moment. Um, another version is that a deep state controls the narrative around COVID-19 so that basically it can use it to its own advantage. And um, to me, it's very interesting that we had in Slovakia the, the exact reverse of this conspiracy theory in February, when people basically claimed that COVID-19 is already widespread, but that the government and, and institutions are, are being silent about it and are not actually giving us um, the correct information. So now to the new world order conspiracy theory. Um, 
This is data from, from Voices of Central and Eastern Europe, a Perceptions of Democracy and Governance report, where we basically monitored and, and uh, collected public uh, opinion poll data from 10 um, European countries. This, this uh, report came out a month ago or so, so this is actually our latest report, but my colleagues actually wrote this one, but um, you know, it's available on our website and I encourage everybody um, to read it who's interested in this data on, um, on belief in some conspiracy theories and disinformation. Because there you can see that um, actually the prominence of, of, uh, of this conspiracy theory in some country is really high. So we wanted to capture really the broad variants of this conspiracy theory. So we asked whether, whether you believe that world affairs are not decided by elected leaders, but it's actually secret groups who are aiming to establish a totalitarian world order. And as you can see in Slovakia, you have 60% of of population who actually believe in this conspiracy theory, followed by Bulgaria and Romania. So these are the exact three countries where, where currently, you know, the, the fact that COVID is presented as a hoax is actually gaining prominence for different sort of reasons. I mean, the discussion about why the data, you know, looks the way it does uh, would be whole another matter, but you can see that there are some countries where the prominence of this conspiracy theory is not so high. I believe that, for example, to me, it's very interesting that Czech Republic has quite low belief in this conspiracy theory, even though we actually share a common cultural historical space. But the difference between Slovakia and Czech Republic is extremely stark. And to say one more thing about, about this data is that in Slovakia, this conspiracy theory is gaining prominence. So we have comparable data from 2018. And back in 2018, it was 53% of population who believed in this conspiracy theory. And now it's already 60%, which is quite worrying. So to go back to some of the most popular uh, COVID related narratives in the region, um, another, another spin or another perspective is that um, COVID-19 is related toward mistrust um, towards governmental institutions. And it, it sort of um, uncovers these, these points of contention or this mistrust. So for example, in, in Bulgaria and Montenegro, um, COVID is seen as, as something that the government abuses to fast forward questionable policies or to, to benefit political agendas of, of political of oligarchs and, and political circles. Whereas in Romania, you have more of the uh, more of the critical narrative towards government not handling the, the crisis properly due to corruption and incompetence. And then another worry, which was also present in Slovakia and not, you know, not because of made up reasons, also that, you know, some of the measures proposed by the government um, are basically infringement on, on, on basic rights and freedoms. And here I would want to say that even though some of these narratives seem to be, you know, to some extent justified, I believe that from this bottom narrative, it's not really too far to the narrative which says that wearing a face mask, you know, is infringement on, on your freedom which is basically something which at the moment really resonates in Slovakia at the time of the second wave. So it's very dangerous. And then the final batch of narratives, which I would like to mention are about um, geopolitics. So um, this was also quite interesting to see that, for example, in Montenegro, one of the prominent narratives is that NATO has kind of failed during the pandemic. Um, or, you know, the narratives in Serbia and Montenegro, which really stress China's international assistance, in particular, when we compare it with EU or NATO, which have been criticized. Um, EU has been criticized in the Czech Republic as well, which is also not so surprising because Czech Republic is a very um, typically Eurosceptic country. But um, there was also a positive narrative about the EU in Serbia claiming, you know, that EU has been actor very helpful in providing assistance to Serbia, but so has been, you know, Russia. 
in, this is a this is a popular narrative in Serbia and interestingly in Slovakia we also had this narrative at the beginning of the pandemic which was quite popular and there has been a public opinion poll survey collected on whether you believe you know that Russia has been helpful to your country when dealing with the pandemic and um, actually Russia uh, may, Russia had a really good result um, in the public opinion poll even though at the time of the data collection no assistance from Russia has been received by Slovakia so it just goes to show you the importance of I guess appearances and um, Finally, in Serbia, you have narratives about you as not being capable or even interested in, in leading the fight against the pandemic. And then a narrative in, in Romania that, that you know, questions uh, the, the origins of, of the COVID-19 and allergies that has been you know, created in Chinese laboratory. In Slovakia, we have a lot of narratives on uh, problematic uh, pages on Facebook which claim that um, that COVID is a biological weapon which was created by the US in order to discredit China. So this is another, another way to put a spin on some of these narratives. So um, this was just a kind of short presentation on, on which narratives resonate. As I, as I said, some of these narratives we will test in public opinion poll surveys, which should be interesting to see um, you know, to what extent do populations actually believe in some of these narratives. But um, what I can clearly say from the case studies in Slovakia or Czech Republic is that the information space is increasingly flooded by all kinds of conspiracy theories and disinformation about the pandemic. And so in the second uh, part of this presentation, I would like to tell you a bit more about the civil society in, in the Czech Republic and in Slovakia and, and about how we are trying to counter um, the impact of some of these disinformation campaigns. So in the Czech Republic, you know, there is a very vibrant civil society which is engaged in, in trying to uh, in trying to promote healthier information space. And among these actors are think tanks such as PSSI and European Values, who for uh, many years now have been actively engaged in this struggle. But some of the more uh, kind of also creative approaches toward information security is, for example, the civil society Nelesh CZ. And this is a, a civil society initiative which basically strives to defend the economies of disinformation, because that's one of those aspects which, you know, sometimes gets neglected in this whole discussion is that actually disinformation is a pro for profit business. And that if we disrupt some of these, um, some of these campaigns, then that may actually have a really higher impact on the information environment than just debunking, for example, or just reacting towards, um, towards a situation that has been created by, by malign actors. So the way Nelesh says it operates is basically they have a list of websites which are independently rated as, as, as harmful and they offer to advertisers the option to not advertise on on these websites in order not to have their brand associated with a website that produces toxic content. And they have quite a lot of partners in the Czech Republic and are quite, you know, successful. Then there is Demagogue, which basically does political fact checking and Czech Elves, which is basically completely voluntary citizen initiative, which strives to fight against this information in an online space by, by organizing campaigns and, and debunking and engaging with actors online. Um, another company which is actually also part of the Nelesh CZ initiative is a Semantic Visions. They are very active in, in trying to provide AI solutions to, to fight against this information. But overall, um, I would say that Czech Republic is somewhat less prone to believe those most mm, spread conspiracy theories. I'm not saying that there are no conspiracy theories present in Czech Republic or that people don't believe in them. Because for example, when we speak about the 
a recent anti-government, anti-corruption protest that took part in uh, took place in Czech Republic um, a while ago. I believe it's around over, definitely over half of population who believe that this has been orchestrated from abroad. So definitely there are some conspiracy theories which are popular, but not, for example, anti-Semitic conspiracies or not this kind of New World Order conspiracy theories. And also, also at the time of pandemic um, and even before Czech and Slovak civil society are trying to cooperate closely in order to to create efficient solutions to problem of disinformation because Czech Republic and Slovakia have a common information space due to language affinity. So there is a lot of um, harmful content that travels from Czech Republic to Slovakia and vice versa. So we actually share this problem. So we're trying to find um, common solutions to, to it, basically. So that brings me to Slovakia. Um, so among the actors uh, engaged uh, in, 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 you know, fight against disinformation are our think tank, Globsec, but then there are others such as SSPI and Stratpol. And um, there's this initiative, Conspiratory.sk, which basically works on a similar basis, such as Nelash says that initiative. It's a database of websites rated as harmful on a scale between one and 10. One is not harmful, 10 is totally untrustworthy source. And the way these rankings are applied is through independent uh, board. So each member rates, you know, certain page based on certain criteria, and then average is cal calculated and based on that, it is decided whether a certain page will be included or not. And again, the result is not just to inform general audiences, but it's to discourage, um, it's to discourage advertisers to place ads on pages of these basically outlets. So again, the idea is that disruption of the economies of disinformation could create healthier information environment. Then there is Checkbot initiative, which is aimed more at the general population. And the idea there is that you can just type, you know, you know and write to this Checkbot and ask, ask him about a particular source. And it works with these existing databases and it provides automated answer to an interested party without this person having to do research because Checkbot will just answer that for you. So that's quite helpful. And then there's Dizzy, which is a fact-checking initiative and um, also info security. But these two uh, latest initiatives are aimed at a broader audience and they are striving to popularize uh, already existing knowledge about the issue of disinformation and conspiracy theories because part of, part of the issue here is that uh, few experts know you know about the problem but it's difficult to communicate these issues towards larger audiences so um info security is very good at actually um creating very interesting content and also very good investigative work because it's led by investigative journalists and um and then they produce uh, facebook content which is quite engaging and that way they are trying to reach wider sort of audiences and increase public resilience towards um, influence operations. But I also would like to stress that the importance of, of, of strategic communication is extremely crucial. And perhaps Slovakia is so, is so vulnerable to conspiracy theories and disinformation because, mm, because there is sort of vacuum where where malign actors can actually exploit um, not enough communication uh, from state institutions towards key audiences. So many civil society actors, which I've already mentioned up till now, are engaged in this type of communication and are trying, you know, to to sort of step in and sometimes, uh, you know, play a role which could be played by by other institutions but usually civil society actors are underfunded and they are also facing threats. Uh, they are often facing lawsuits 
Um, so it, it's a really tough job for civil society actors to be carrying out some of this work, which would be better if, if uh, relevant state institutions carried out, particularly, you know, in the area of campaigning and awareness raising. But I don't want to generalize because in Slovakia, we actually have several good examples uh, of public officials and state institutions which are doing great job in strategic communication. So one of the examples here is our Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ivan Korčok, who actually, um, you know, when, when there is a flood of disinformation in relation to, to foreign policy, he, he steps in and actually does a press conference where he himself will debunk you know, certain misconceptions. And this is extremely helpful because when prime minister says it, it reaches much wider audience than if just, you know, um, some civil society actor was debunking things essentially. And recently when we talk about the pandemic, we also had initiative by um, Ministry of Health in Slovakia, which is finally trying to not only debunk some of the most pertinent and most dangerous um, disinformation in relation to, to the COVID pandemic, but also, um, you know, taking on actors which, which basically are present on, in Slovak information space for many years and are peddling uh, dangerous health-related disinformation. So these steps we really appreciate as civil society and we are just kind of hoping and, and, and advocating for really systematic approach to, this, to these issues because they could really make a world of difference. And last but not least, I'd like to mention our Alliance for Healthy Info Infosphere, which we have established um, actually just a few months ago. But um, because what we see as a crucial problem is actually a structural problem with the way our digital spaces operate, which disinformation and malign actors are just consequence of. So we as an alliance advocate for small markets, which are basically harmed the worst when it comes to lawless digital space. Because when you see Facebook or Google implementing certain uh, measures which are supposed to protect our information space, these measures are not applied equally across all across all markets essentially. So for example, recently Google announced that it will defund all this information related to COVID-19. And this was announced, I believe, back in August. But when I browse Slovak internet, I still see COVID disinformation has Google ads placed next to it because obviously this rule is not enforced um, properly across all markets and hence our information environment is still heavily impacted by by these by these lawless spaces so at the moment we have uh, six member states six european member states in our alliance and ten organizations and basically what we are advocating for um mainly at the moment is is basically providing uh, feedback to european commission because two uh, initiatives are planned the digital services act and also the european democracy action plan both of which um to some extent and, and from different angles are trying to address the issue of disinformation and hate speech online. So we, are, we have been really uh, engaged in these two activities, but we are planning more and, and we're also open to, to new members because uh, we really think that we need to address the systematic issues first in order to truly create a healthier inf information environment um, for, for everyone really, and particularly for these, some of these smaller markets. So thank you so much for your attention. That is you know, my presentation about the state of civil society in Czech Republic and Slovakia um, in relation to you know, the COVID-19 infodemic that we're currently facing. If you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to discuss. Yeah, thank you very much, Miroslava. Uh, it was a very informative presentation, and I think in Slovakia from the beginning the civil society played a very important role because even before any official reaction back in late January or February, 
the, some rectors and deans decided to cancel classes and uh, oh, yeah. contributed to public awareness and uh, so civil society mobilized earlier than the authorities. To some extent, yes, yeah. And also then um, I believe it was um, municipalities which reacted really quickly in Bratislava and that inspired the governmental response afterwards, soon enough, fortunately. Uh, just uh, before we proceed with questions, uh, uh, let me just welcome Andrei Yeliseo, who fortunately could join us at the last moment. So after question and answer with Miroslava, we may proceed with a presentation because it would be interesting uh, considering that first uh, there was no governmental policy as far as I understand in Belarus, uh, meaning any quarantine or other measures related to the pandemic. And so we may start with the role of the Russian civil society and also continue with the present events where civil society has been playing an even greater role. And, but just for a few minutes now, let's have a question and answer session with Miroslav. Although hopefully she may still till the end of this event as well. So, who last to ask some questions? Armin, if I could. Yeah. Yes. Please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Miroslav, for your very thorough uh, presentation. Very much information. Very interesting, uh, especially into consideration taking into consideration that this region is heavily, heavily linked uh, with Baltic states. Um, I have one, maybe very precise question, but I hopefully you will help me to find the answer for it. From what I read, a lot of, um, quite of influential people, I would say, in Serbia are not so much, uh, so to speak, uh, following all the recommendations in order to avoid uh, COVID-19. I'm first and foremost speaking about Novak Djokovic. Uh, my question is, with that regard, does this in any way influence the situation not only in Serbia but also in the whole region? And Djokovic is one of the examples. The second one that was in my mind is uh, football player Jovic, who's playing for Real Madrid. He also was one of the uh, persons who, so to speak, uh, came into appearance in this kind of a bad regard, I must admit. So does this in any way influence the situation not only in Serbia, but also in the whole region? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, well, I can, well, we don't have hard data for this yet, but as I said, we are in the process of collecting this public opinion poll surveys. And even though it, you know, because I, th I believe the question of direct impact of disinformation being shared and how it influences beliefs on one hand and then behavior on the other is incredibly complex because you have more factors coming in. And so we can't really say that there is immediate direct link, but at least the public opinion, public opinion poll surveys allow us to see to what extent people already believe in some disinformation, even though we can't say whether, you know, to what extent Novak Djokovic is responsible for that particular contribution. But it's clear if you see, I mean, if you see from his Facebook engagement, because he's like by far the most prominent, the most influential person on Serbian Facebook, actually. So, it certainly is not a good news that this kind of influence is like a massive influencer um, promotes um, unscientific conclusions. And we have actually um, similar examples from the region, of course. I believe we would find such examples in almost every country. In Slovakia, a lot of prominent figures are complaining about um, the measures implemented, you know, or actors or singers some of them, uh, we have prominent people who claim that this virus is not as dangerous as, you know, as the TV, for example, or, or institutions make out to be. And these people are, share massive, you know, followership and hence 
it can be said that certainly they are at least what they're at least doing is that once once fringe narratives are now becoming increasingly mainstream and this definitely you know um, in a terms of pandemic is extremely actually dangerous so yes we and we are aware of, of the of the Novak Djokovic case as, as well yeah I believe personally I believe that the influence is there but I can't give you exact numbers because you know we there's no way of actually precisely measuring that thank you very much uh, so I would like to ask a question about the relating the pandemic to migration because well there is immigration in especially in Hungary has been a case for over five years already so, mm -hmm. so uh, how does it connect with the currently closed borders mm -hmm. and uh, at the same time not long ago just a few days since Orban closed the borders virtually to even to EU members, although Poles, Czechs and Slovaks persuaded to let their citizens in. Mm -hmm. But uh, what has been happening since then? Are there another mutual restrictions now on travel now because of the outbreak in the Czech Republic mm -hmm. or some other issues? Mm -hmm. So the situation is changing and it is unfolding and I believe that you know there was this kind of assumption that the V4 countries are sort of sticking together and are going to allow um, citizens of the respective countries to to move a bit more freely but in terms of Slovakia at the moment we are very concerned about the sharp rise of numbers in Czech Republic in particular um, so it's you know, at the moment, there will be, I believe, at least border controls there. So this whole situation with the pandemic is very interesting, also from the perspective of the Schengen, you know, because I think people accepted very quickly that these controls are reinstated and there is a logical reason for their need to, to be there. But I think we need to sort of divide this issue into um sort of the inside out perspective because i think it's not really the, from the perspective of the citizens it's not so much about reinstating border controls um in the schengen area but the fact that hungary you know and other um countries where the anti-migration sentiment is really strong closing the borders there may be actually a very popular thing from the perspective of the of the general population you know because at the beginning um obviously it is a security and health concern but as you said the, the anti-migration narrative has been really strong in hungary at least since the migration crisis around let's say 2015 and still this narrative is is extremely popular and when it comes to when it comes to covid measures in terms of traveling um you know at the moment even if you wanted to travel to slovakia there are there are several um conditions that you need to fulfill in order to be able to just sort of enter the country and also um, we have just since yesterday implemented much stricter regime so i think we are possibly heading towards, I don't want to say another lockdown, but definitely a situation whereby there will be stronger controls on the borders and, and just less, you know, uh, events happening and, and all these kinds of things. So, um, you know, I think this, this kind of um, measures are accepted generally by the population so far. Thank you. And any other questions, perhaps? I think, well, we day by day get some interesting news. Just a couple of days ago, again, there was some news that 
a guy who was previously in Jobbik, I believe, in Hungary, created a new party of his own name. Uh, unfortunately, I forgot the surname. And, and uh, these conspiracy theories are kind of among the basic ideas that he spread. So, uh, have you heard about that? Or maybe? Mm -hmm. So I believe that the one reason why perhaps this new party is is created in Hungary is because Jobbik is not what it used to be. It's not as extreme as it used to be in the... Yeah, yeah, the moved towards the center. Yeah, exactly. So maybe, you know, now then this person sees that there is a potential for actually um, creating or representing this sort of very far-right conspiracy sort of prone population because um, with, with the way uh, our digital spaces operate, you can very quickly um, gain popularity among, among um, vulnerable populations like that. So I, I do definitely see the reason why somebody would, would see it as a, as a potential political ambition, because we see that in Hungary, you know, it often it is politicians who actually spread conspiracy theories in, into the mainstream. And, you know, so I, I'm not surprised that um, ambitious individuals are, are going for this. In Slovakia, we have a similar situation with the extreme far-right Kotlebas party, which, um, you know, historians and experts actually call a fascist party. And um, they have a quite strong um, voting base. In the latest elections, they actually achieved, I believe it was around 8% of votes, which really isn't a small achievement. For the second um, time, they're now represented in, in the Slovak parliament. And they are actively spreading conspiracy theories, you know, about the 5G and the vaccinations and nanochips and literally the really the hardcore COVID conspiracy theories. And they promote these conspiracy theories not only online, but also in the TV, because whenever they get um, invited for a political discussion, they use TV platform as a way to spread conspiracy theories. So another reason or another factor which, which is very problematic with these actors, with the political actors who spread this information is that they not only use online sphere, which is gaining increasing prominence, but they are, you know, then they have space on TV and, and really spread their messages through, through traditional media as well. So we have similar examples in Slovakia too, yeah. Yeah, so, and, uh, how about uh, Facebook's policies recently? Because in Hungary they closed down a lot of pages spreading mm -hmm. disinformation about the pandemic a few days ago. So that guy and some others also from an early Yobik spin-off, I think, uh, mm -hmm. were they were also unhappy about that. Yeah. Well, in terms of Facebook, it, it's hard to monitor. Uh, the system, you know, the systematic closure of certain accounts, or even the the reason behind it, because we always have to rely on what Facebook tells us and 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 what where the steps they have taken. Um, in Slovakia, I still see most of the disinformation pages spreading hardcore conspiracy theories about COVID nineteen are very active still, and they reach we are talking about like thousands of people who are targeted by, the, by this messaging. And even though, you know, Facebook has certain policies, usually these are very much PR related. So hence, they are not entirely efficient because Facebook often reacts to negative PR and or tries to prevent negative PR. But that at the same time means that these changes are not systematic. Another problem with Facebook is that um, for them, the, the, the phenomenon of false um, information is actually not a reason for content being taken down. So every time you report, for example, COVID hoax, which even though it can kill if somebody you know, wants to 
act on this kind of information, Facebook will not take such information down. So for me, it's always interesting to see that they are, you know, um, taking down these pages because they don't necessarily do that everywhere. So to me, there is a lack of transparency and, and lack of general systemic rules, lack of oversight, which is problematic. And of course, every time um, a conspiracy theory page is taken down or, or hateful content taken down, that's great, but I'm afraid it's not enough. And also in the case of Hungary, this problem may be compounded even by um, government wanting to interfere in the digital space. And if we're talking about governments which are not necessarily clearly democratic, then we're really entering a problematic arena because, um, for example, in Germany, you have the Net DG law, which strives to regulate digital space in the absence of European regulation. But Russia has implemented literally a similar law which they are just using to, you know, silence the dissent. So it's, it's a very tricky issue. Yes, I believe there is some balance between taking down harm, harmful information and like mm -hmm. in Russia, restricting mm -hmm. the freedom of speech in general. So, this may be an issue in several countries and depends mm -hmm. on the level of democratic development, maybe. Absolutely. So, any other questions? So, if there are no more questions, I would like to thank you, Mirosara, for so the presentation much. and the entire participation today. And I hope we'll have the, an opportunity to continue operating on these or some other such issues. Absolutely, looking forward to that. Yeah. So, thank you. And Andrea, are, are you ready to? Oh. Uh, yes, if, if you can hear me, I can briefly uh, speak yes. about the uh, so, uh, situation so, in Belarus. Please join me in welcoming Andrei Yelisev, who can provide an update on the situation in Belarus. So in Belarus, uh, in terms of the um, uh, COVID-related propaganda and disinformation, the state authorities um, like repeating that uh, uh, our approach was um, identical or very close to Sweden's. Uh, this is not true. Um, and uh, because the state authorities uh, in Belarus uh, uh, did not introduce even uh, uh, those minimal uh, measures of social distancing that uh, Sweden did, and the information policies uh, were horrible in contrast to Sweden. So in Belarus, um, the uh, state media and uh, of officials uh, repeatedly um, um, downplayed the risks uh, posed by the epidemic. Uh, they uh, um, uh, put forward uh, various uh, conspiracies. Uh, the country ruler uh, even uh, offended uh, people who died from coronavirus, uh, saying that uh, it, it was their fault and so on. So uh, I did a, a compilation of uh, uh, excerpts of um, state media reports about uh, coronavirus. I'd like uh, you uh, to see it. I hope uh, that I'll be able to to share uh, the screen and uh, the the computer sounds. Uh, let's try. Okay. Приятно смотреть по телевизору. Люди на тракторе работают, никто не говорит про вирусы. Там трактор вылечит всех, полю всех лечит. Вчера мне врачи сказали, что при ультрафиолете, вот в солнечном свете, вирус погибает. Так чего же мы прячем людей в эти крематории? В эти... Что касается парада, как бы это ни настораживало присутствующих здесь врачей, должен сказать, что... Мы не можем отменить парад. 
просто не можем. В год юбилея Победы, возможно, не лишнее вспомнить, как 75 лет назад, объединившись народом, удалось победить коричневую чуму 20 века. А уж она-то была куда страшнее коронавирусной инфекции COVID-19. И, конечно, мы не могли удержаться, чтобы не побывать на неделе на футболе. Все-таки о нем сейчас говорит весь мир. Белорусский чемпионат – единственный из всех европейских, которые не отменили из-за пандемии. Физкульт привет от белорусских футболистов. Наш протест против пандемии, ну или просто способ порадовать болельщиков. Их сегодня, кстати, говорят даже больше, чем обычно. Матч ведь принципиальный. В европейские страны сомневаются, продлевать карантин или нет. И не то, чтобы болеть перестали или поддались на усталость населения от карантина. Просто экономика на дне. И может быть правительство России, перекрывшее границу с Беларусью, также лихо и с другими проблемами разберется? Ведь в соседней стране, где каждый год умирает полмиллиона человек из-за проблем с алкоголем, и каждый час двое погибают в ДТП, коронавирус вряд ли самое страшное зло. Пока мировые политики стараются избегать общения, а народ остро чувствует вот такое разделение между собой и сильными мира сего, белорусский президент едет на предприятие, общается с коллективом. Впрочем, причин для паники нет. Не так страшен вирус, как его малюют в СМИ. Кричащие заголовки, конечно, и города, и страны берут. Сами это прекрасно понимаем, но пострадать здесь скорее можно от вируса паники. Еще вопрос, что страшнее, болезнь или паника на фоне? На 100% от вирусов никто не может застраховаться. Паника – страшное дело. Паника ускоряет течение болезни, усиливает болезнь. Поэтому надо идти от жизни. Нас когда-то Чернобылем пугали, мы пережили и живем. Переживем и это. Я искренне вам сказал, что от коронавируса, чисто от коронавируса, никто не погиб. Никто не умер. Умерли от хронических болезней и при том уже в преклонном возрасте. Да, ведь каждый сложный момент сопровождается информационным давлением. Причем, к сожалению, приходится замечать, что зачастую, чем лучше мы действуем, тем яростнее это давление. Возможно, пора использовать как своего рода индикатор, как стрелку компаса. Значит, верно идем. Получается так. Right, so I, I hope uh, you could uh, hear, hear the sound. Uh, it's only a brief compilation of um, ridiculous things uh, that uh, state media uh, told us uh, uh, in the last uh, half a year. Um, uh, as you can see, they did um, ridiculous, uh, ridiculous uh, comparisons to the um, uh, death uh, to Chernobyl, the Second World War, and uh, And, um, other uh, uh, accidents uh, provoking deaths and, and so on. Uh, actually, uh, this um, responsible approach towards the uh, coronavirus epidemic was one of the reasons uh, for, uh, for the unprecedented uh, 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 political mobilization and uh, the scale of civil disobedience we are observing now in Belarus. And the, um, the state authorities um, minimized uh, the, um, uh, the uh, number of deaths associated with the coronavirus and uh, presented it uh, 10, 15 times lower than it was. Uh, the statistics which was uh, uh, shared by the um, Belarusian state bodies with the United Nations Uh, allowed us to see real uh, mortality associated with coronavirus in April, uh, June. And uh, it, uh, it follows that the number of uh, excess deaths in Belarus uh, in these three months was over 6,000, which makes Belarus one of the worst countries in Europe and probably in the world uh, in terms of uh, mortality from uh, coronavirus. We do not still have the real statistics for July, September, uh, but uh, uh, as, as we know, the, the figures for, um, for April, May and June, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, they already um, exceed uh, the Swedish number of uh, figures of uh, coronavirus uh, associated deaths Um, within six months. So we can see that uh, Belarus, uh, Belarusian approach uh, was, uh, uh, was really different from, from, from Swedish and uh, uh, resulted in, uh, in many thousands of uh, uh, excess deaths. 
despite the Belarusian state propaganda compares uh, Belarus approach to, to Sweden's, in fact, it's, it mostly resembled the approach taken by Turkmenistan and Tajikistan. Um, uh, well, uh, this, uh, this whole propaganda by, by, by state authorities was, uh, was exposed uh, by, by a number of uh, uh, media initiatives and uh, think tanks uh, uh, like uh, the one I work for. But uh, lately, uh, due to the unprecedented political events, uh, the coronavirus uh, uh, issue is uh, uh, largely overshadowed and uh, not much attention is paid by, uh, by uh, um, fact-checking initiatives or uh, media, independent media to the topic of coronavirus because all eyes are on political protests uh, 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 on uh, on the consequences of the unprecedented uh, vote rigging in Belarus, uh, human rights abuses, and so on. So, despite Belarus is entering the second wave of the coronavirus an epidemic, uh, not much attention is paid uh, to this topic as it was uh, in uh, April, May, or June uh, when the um, first wave of coronavirus uh, took place. Um, all right, I, I guess I, I will stop here and uh, we'll um, be happy to answer your questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Andre. So, uh, are there any questions? Armin, if I may. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, thank you, Andre, very much for your presentation for the video compilation actually shows quite a lot. I have two questions. The first one is, does the concern about second wave of coronavirus in a way affect protests in Belarus? And second of all, um, how protests uh, influenced the second wave of coronavirus? Do we see a spike somewhere or a rise of, uh, rise of COVID-19 cases how this correlates. Thank you. Thank you. I, I believe that, um, that uh, the coronavirus concerns uh, do not uh, influence much the uh, protesting moods in Belarus. I also assume that uh, the, uh, the larger impact to the spread of coronavirus did not the uh, protest rallies per se but um, the way the state authorities um, treated protesters um, uh, following the elections when they when they packed uh, beaten and tortured uh, people say uh, 50 70 sometimes over 100 people uh, in a yard uh, we, uh, in a yard uh, of uh, 15 20 square meters um, then you can imagine that uh, the um, possibilities for a coronavirus spread were enormous and uh, uh, such cases when uh, when healthy uh, people were uh, packed in detention uh, centers and um, then uh, tested positive with coronavirus were highlighted in the media so I uh, I would stress that uh, despite the state authorities um, hints at protest rallies um it's uh, the uh, the underlying reason was the uh, complete disregard to human rights and uh, um and enormous abuses of human rights which Belarusian authorities allowed uh, following the elections thank you very much andre yes sanjo please I have a question. Um, do you have uh, in Belarus some unofficial tools to measure the impact of COVID-19? I mean, to, to have some numbers that are not uh, uh, the same as the, the official one, because I think it's very difficult for you to measure the impact uh, at the level of the society. Um, we've got... Um a few online platforms which gather uh, COVID-related information. Uh, one is called uh, COVID Economy, launched by Barok uh, Economic Think Tank. 
uh, you can uh, you can get uh, various information pertaining to economic consequences of coronavirus and uh, and the impact and the businesses uh, response to uh, to the epidemic because uh, because in Belarus uh, um, over 200 companies uh, contributed to the fight um, against uh, coronavirus through financial donations or pro bono services and uh, contributed uh, a lot to um, with the medical equipment to, to hospitals and so on. You can see this, uh, you can find this information on coviteconomy.by plus uh, there's a website called COVID Monitor launched by human rights organization Human Constanta. It uh, gathers uh, um, various um, and documents and official statistics, uh, uh, various scattered responses by local authorities in Belarus and so on. Uh, when it goes to, um, to alternative uh, statistics, then uh, you, um, there's no way uh, to get it. Uh, but as I mentioned, it happened so uh, oddly enough that uh, uh, despite the state authorities um, covered the uh, um, death-related statistics from the public, uh, the uh, state bodies passed it uh, for month, for April and June to UN uh, bodies. So UN bodies uh, published the statistics on their website, and we can see real, um, real uh, numbers of excess deaths for for this uh, for the, for this three months until July. We still do not have statistics, uh, um, real statistics on deaths uh, from from July. So um, I, I guess then the aggregate number could be as as high as ten thousand uh, ten thousand deaths uh, so far. So I'd like to ask a question. In the video compilation, we heard that some of the messages that were transmitted resembled the Russian messages about European countries' economies on the verge of failing. But there were also these uh, mentioning too many Russians dying of vodka and car accident. So it was quite an interesting mixture of propaganda, I think. Could you a bit elaborate on that? Uh, also, uh, what has been the role of Russian media in Belarus? I remember, you, well, that was your publication before the pandemic about uh, Sputnik Belarus. And uh, could you please elaborate on that as well? So what kind of mixture of this disinformation or misinformation you are getting in Belarus. Uh, during the uh, first wave um, in, uh, in in spring, the Belarusian state media lashed uh, at both the EU and Russia because uh, Russia closed the borders with uh, with Belarus uh, um, in uh, disregarding the um, Lukashenko's um, view on this. Uh, so you could see that in that compilation, uh, the state media criticized both uh, the um, the um, uh, Western countries and, and, and Russia too. It, it all changed um, uh, suddenly after the elections, when, as as far as you know, the um, uh, the state's policies in Belarus changed completely and uh, ter and uh, uh, took. Um, very pro-Russian turn. So after that, uh, the whole uh, media um, uh, propaganda, media agenda in Belarus state's uh, TV channels was uh, synchronized completely with Russia's. So at, the, at this point, uh, all uh, major propaganda and disinformation narratives are the same as in the program and TV channels. You won't find explicit uh, criticism of uh, Russia's policies towards uh, the coronavirus epidemic. Um, on the contrary, and uh, the uh, uh, Russian vaccine uh, is praised. And as you may know, the Belarusian prime minister uh, got uh, uh, vaccinated uh, with it. So, um, so the um, 
uh, quality of Belarusian propaganda and so the extent of its uh, propaganda messages uh, changed uh, dramatically uh, after uh, August events. Uh, currently, it's uh, all about uh, anti-Western propaganda, about uh, na Nazi-like West uh, going to harm Belarus in, in many ways, uh, so-called color uh, revolution technologies, aggressive Poland and Lithuania um, want to dismember Belarus and so on. So, um, and generally, as I mentioned, the coronavirus issue is is not uh, among the uh, most popular topics uh, in um, in um, state propaganda um, agenda now. Yes, Miroslav, please. Uh, thank you for, for the interesting presentation and the, the video clips, Andre, that was super interesting. I was wondering whether um, whether the COVID narratives are being used against the protesters, you know, because there's certainly an angle which state propaganda could, could take to actually use this narrative against, against the protesters, or is, is the government still in denial about the existence of COVID at all as it was in the past? Yes, thank you indeed, the state authorities um... Uh, happened to mention that uh, the uh, second wave uh, is associated with protest rallies and uh, the other day the acting health minister um, said explicitly that, uh, that uh, this was the reason for um, recent uh, increase in coronavirus cases in Belarus. Uh, so, uh, and uh, I, I, I also need to mention that uh, the uh, coronavirus uh, uh, was used widely as an excuse to, um, uh, to prevent independent observation of election in Belarus because uh, just uh, about uh, two weeks uh, prior to the election, the Central Election uh, Commission, commission um, adopted a decision that due to the grave epidemiological situation, only three uh, observers are allowed at, uh, uh, at a given polling stations. And uh, in 99% of cases, all, the, all three uh, observers uh, were uh, fake pro-government observers representing some gongos. So this way, um, having the coronavirus epidemic as an excuse, the state authorities prevented uh, independent observation uh, during the presidential election. Yes, yes, Stephanie. Please. Thank you very much, Armen. Uh, Andre, uh, thank you very much for uh, this new information about. Uh, what is happening in uh, the Belarusian uh, society. So my question is, what is the perception about coronavirus pandemic um, in the Belarusian society? Because uh, as you mentioned, the official uh, rhetoric and the official um, speech has changed about, uh, about uh, coronavirus. So, uh, what is the perception in uh, into the society? Thank you. Uh, from the very beginning of the epidemic, the Belarusian society uh, took it uh, quite seriously, and a number of uh, um, initiatives, uh, civic initiatives, uh, which uh, gathered uh, money to support uh, hospitals um, with uh, the medical equipment in deficit. Uh, were launched uh, uh, foremost uh, the initiative call, uh, called by COVID-19. Uh, so um, despite uh, the irresponsible state authorities, um, independent media and civic initiatives uh, um, um, introduced uh, and did a great job and explained uh, the public the risks associated with the coronavirus. So, uh, so we could uh, see on the 
um, on the uh, Google Trends that, uh, that uh, despite uh, the absence of uh, state-managed uh, um, uh, measures, the, um, the extent of uh, social distances, distancing that Belarusians observed, say, in May, um, uh, decreased at about 20-30%. So it was, uh, it, it followed from the actions taken by, by society, no, not, not the state bodies. Uh, but um, if we if we speak about the um, current situation, then the um, human rights situation and uh, political events. I mean, uh, I, I mean the uh, um, uh, the uh, illegal and illegitimate stay of Lukashenko's uh, Alexander Lukashenko in power are uh, much more important issues. Uh, discussed by the uh, Belarusian society than the coronavirus epidemic. Uh, although the risks um, by uh, risks um, from coronavirus uh, did not uh, disappear, and uh, we are clearly entering the second wave, and we we are seeing the um, uh, stable increase in cases over the last two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh any more questions for Andre? Well, uh, thank you very much, Andre, and I hope we will have also a small article from you related to the topic of your presentation. And uh, let me now uh, turn to the, the next presentation. I would like to ask Angela to make it. Well, we had a pleasure to read your interview in in Armenian, but we will publish the the English version soon as well. And uh, perhaps you may elaborate on the topic of a civil society's role. Uh, first of all, uh, Armen, thank you for organizing the second event within our project and uh, I'm happy to share with you some thoughts about uh, the impact of the pandemic on civil society. As uh, I was involved in, a, in a, an elaboration of a policy pro, uh, paper that uh, was dedicated to, to the civil society, you cannot see many uh, uh, initiatives dedicated to uh, elaborate and to research the impact of the pandemic for on the civil uh, for the civil society in the Black Sea region. Uh, today I will stop only to the Eastern Partnership countries and maybe uh, a few words about Romania that my colleague uh, Catalin will, will join later. Uh, but uh, why I was um, so interested in to study and to research the impact of the uh, of the pandemic on civil society is because uh, I am I am aware about the fact that this pandemic has also an impact on the on the beneficiaries of the uh, projects of the of the civil society and I cannot uh, uh, Mm, let you think only about the NGOs, but also about the uh, public institutions, about the uh, vulnerable people, about the uh, society as a as a as a whole, and um, the rest uh, the. Um, the idea behind this policy paper was to see not only uh, the protests and how uh, uh, peaceful assembly was affected as a liberty, as a fundamental fundamental right of the of the people, but also to look at the freedom of association and uh, at the freedom of, freedom of expression. And many of you even today have uh, uh, talked or s uh, mentioned the disinformation, me mentioned the uh, debunking uh, uh, initiatives in our countries, but it is important to mention here the rights of the journalists 
how their work was affected by the pandemic. It is, it is important here to mention uh, uh, how the uh, movement right was affected and how the socioeconomic uh, rights of the people uh, involved in civil society were also affected by the by the pandemic. Uh, as we have mentioned even in last uh, debate, many countries were not ready to face this, uh, uh, this pandemic and uh, even civil society was not ready. Um, we usually think that we are prepared, but we are not prepared for such, uh, uh, for such events. And um, it, it was, what exactly happened in the, all of our countries, but uh, mostly in those countries that have a, a very low uh, socioeconomic uh, uh, preparedness to, to such kind of, uh, of uh, uh, crisis. Uh, the case of Belarus uh, is obvious that it, uh, to to uh, increase the awareness about how the leadership can affect the uh, uh, struggle of the society against uh, against the coronavirus. But also it was important for, for us to look at uh, such leaders as Igor Dodon in Moldova, or maybe uh, uh, at uh, leaders uh, in some European countries. I mean, here, uh, here Romania has, we had some leaders that were, uh, mm, um, promoting some uh, disinformation in the public space with the aim to obtain some support, some political support from different, uh, from different actors. Uh, for civil society, it was important to not lose the identity and to remain a partner, a partner not only for the beneficiaries, but also for the public institution in order to uh, support them to fight uh, uh, against the spread of, uh, of the coronavirus in, the, in different regions in, in the society. Uh, and sometimes uh, we decided for us that our mission is not only to inform people, but also to help them and to help them in the region, to help the, them on, on, local, uh, on local ground. Um, and at the same time, uh, to uh, define our rights, to uh, express our vision regarding the development of the society, of uh, transparency, to find solutions for different kind of problems that we are facing now, uh, to support the partnership with the public institutions uh, and to distribute services to the vulnerable uh, people where uh, government, uh, government authorities fail to, to to reach the, the, their, their own uh, citizens. At the same time, uh, the relationship, relationship with public uh, authorities uh, was damaged. And sometimes we have witnessed the real fights to survive the restriction imposed by the authorities, authorities but also to survive the intention of the, the authorities to shrink the space for civil society. And I'll give you here an example of the Moldovan uh, 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 civil society who uh, the NGOs from Moldova were very active to defend their uh, legal framework, the, the right to have a, a good legal framework to, to regulate the uh, NGOs. And uh, it was the intention of the uh, party in power to uh, change uh, some of the articles uh, in the law that was elaborated in uh, a partnership with uh, civil society representatives uh, a few years ago. But uh, the fact that we were so uh, uh, cautious and we were so um, uh, we're looking so uh, careful uh, to the action and to the activity of the of the government uh, uh, helped us to uh, uh, have a, a now a, a good uh, a legal framework for the NGOs in Moldova and not to lose the fight against the intention uh, to decrease the, the space uh, for development of the civil society. Uh, also, it was good to have this time, uh, this time, this whole time, uh, the support of the donors in the region. 
um, it was uh, uh, important that they have uh, listened to the civil society war, uh, voice and changed their programs dedicated to, to the NGOs. And we uh, had a lot of um, uh, projects uh, dedicated to this information. Uh, a lot of projects dedicated to vulnerable people and uh, uh, this helped a lot in order to uh, make the donors to understand that there are also some needs that they will have to support if they want to have a real partnership with civil society from, uh, from the region. Um, and also it was important for civil society to uh, continue to support the monitoring of the impact of the pandemic uh, not only on uh, uh, economic uh, uh, level, but also to, to monitor uh, those three freedoms that I have mentioned at the beginning. And such a tool was the uh, Civicus Monitor. And you can find there a lot of information that is dedicated to the impact of the pandemic on civil society. Uh, and as I mentioned, they are using three pillars. To, to monitor um, uh, the impact, uh, freedom of association, freedom of peaceful assembly, and uh, freedom of uh, expression. And you can track there uh, all the countries from, from the region, and also uh, in the Civicus Monitor is included the, the, are included the Baltic states. Um, as I mentioned, our um, pandemic mission, uh, pandemic mission of the civil society was to uh, contribute a lot to the correct information of the population about the COVID-19 means. And uh, uh, we, we cannot minimize here the partnership uh, between the journalists and civil society, between journalists and activists, bloggers, between uh, and sometimes between uh, uh, civil society actors from the region and the international platforms and uh, uh, owners of uh, such companies as Facebook or Twitter because um, even if uh, Miroslava mentioned some uh, efforts that were not sustained by the by such kind of uh, companies, there are also good example in the region. I mean uh, uh, Georgia, I mean Ukraine, uh, where we have some partnership bet developed between the civil society actors, journalists, and and Facebook, for for example. Um, of course, there are many of uh, uh, political actors that are interested in order to use the pandemic uh, to influence the public opinion and to uh, 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 get some uh, uh, some political support from uh, different category of uh, of. Uh, 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 civil society actors. And we, as I mentioned last time, while we were talking about the hybrid war and the hybrid tools that are used uh, during the pandemic, there were a lot of NGO that uh, supported this information. And all of those NGOs uh, are associated, associated or affiliated with some uh, Foreign, foreign uh, actors or with some uh, religious uh, um, actors. I mean, with uh, the church in the Republic of Moldova. Uh, this is a, this is one of the examples, and uh, this made uh, uh, very difficult our mission uh, to um, redirect the, the resources available to stop the spread of the pandemic to uh, those projects that were related to uh, debunking. Uh, and uh, sometimes for us, it was an incorrect use of the available resources for, for that. Um, and the, the, the message was the same as Miroslava mentioned, uh, 5G and uh, conspiracy theories and the vaccination and Bill Gates. In Moldova, not only Bill Gates, but also uh, Soros was mentioned a lot of times in the in the media as a source for this information. Um, and uh, it, it, it is interesting how the same messages are uh, used by uh, political actors interested in, in to control the the public opinion in the same way in different countries. Maybe a little bit different, but 
the the final aim is the same to control the public opinion and to get support of those vulnerable uh, social categories um, we have monitored uh, several, several civil society actions and initiatives and i would like to um, i would like to uh, give you some examples of, on how civil society and journalists inform the public opinion about the uh, impact of the pandemic in the region. Uh, Moldova and Armenia were very active in, uh, uh, in the fight against the censorship. And they had a victory in this, uh, in this regard, as uh, in Moldova, a decision of the uh, Council of, uh, of the Audiovisual Council was uh, 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 abolished. And in Armenia, after a, a very um, uh, fruitful intervention of the whole uh, um, Media uh, of the of all media experts, uh, uh, they uh, they had this victory against the, the imposed censorship, and imposed censorship that means to use only official information from the official uh, sources. That means from the government, the government who controls the uh, the tools, who controls the. Uh, uh, public uh, TV channels, uh, who controls the, the financial resources. And uh, this was obvious that is uh, a common fight in Moldova and also in Armenia. And uh, it was good to, uh, to follow these uh, initiatives, to follow uh, these um, uh, voices in the, in, uh, on Facebook, on social media, on, uh, on different uh, uh, independent media. Also, uh, I would like to give the, the example of Romania and later Catalina will add something uh, uh, related to, to, to Bucharest uh, uh, initiatives. Uh, in Romania, we have witnessed an important number of reports elaborated by the Romanian experts in order to debunk misinformation or uh, uh, those messages that were sent to, to the society by foreign actors. And it is important uh, that we uh, have witnessed this cooperation, not only among journalists, not only among media experts, but also between journalists and political scientists. Um, in the past, uh, it was very difficult to combine those efforts, but now we, we have a lot of projects and those projects are very good and very helpful for, uh, for us to understand better how uh, the social media is used, uh, who are the interested actors. We, we can identify those messages and we can see we can follow and we can see uh, the final goal of the disinformation. Uh, and uh, maybe as a recommend recommendation for the journalists and for, uh, for the political scientists, they should uh, um, uh, pledge or be aware about the fact that uh, they will have to uh, invite in those initiatives IT experts because sometimes the separate fight uh, for the same uh, goal, it's not productive. And uh, only together and only ha having this cohesion, they can build a reliable strategy to avoid uh, uh, the using of the social media or the other tools uh, for uh, misinformation campaigns. Uh, on the other hand, we, we need more education, more education not only for adult people, but also for kids. Uh, this is something that we are missing in, in Romania and uh, in the countries from the, from the Black Sea region. Uh, the banking is not enough, uh, and if it's not accompanied by uh, a critical thinking uh, tools to, to equip our citizens how to make the difference between the messages that are sent uh, to to them, and uh, uh, I have some examples on uh, the um, situation that we have followed during the pandemic in in Georgia. Uh, I mentioned that it was affected the freedom of movement and freedom of peaceful assembly. 
in the majority of the of the countries uh, and it was difficult not only for social workers and for beneficiaries of those social programs but also it was difficult uh, uh, to travel from one region to another and to be involved in different kind of uh, projects dedicated to the to the final beneficiaries in this context in, in this context it uh, the support uh, the support of the volunteer move, uh, movements was very important and civil society proved to be uh, in this regard, one of the main drivers of the volunteers' uh, movements in the in the region. Um, you know how uh, uh, the restriction affected all of us, uh, and uh, we were not able to to organize the events, to meet face to face, and to contribute to the uh, content of the to the improvement of the content of the public policy only after a few mo months we have uh, uh, mm, managed to organize some public debates uh, some uh, uh, mm, uh, interaction with public authorities not only because they were not uh, interested in in that because no one has abolished the association agreements between georgia moldova ukraine and the european union it was important to monitor it it was important to express recommendations to express uh, and to give solutions from uh, for some problems but it uh, it was uh, at the same time, very difficult to organize those meetings, those uh, uh, debates uh, in an ordinary, ordinary way. And I still think that uh, the civil society can influence the uh, content of the public policy, but at the same time, we have some recommendations for, for the authorities and for the donors. And those recommendations are um, very practical uh, and can be a guide um, uh, for for our authorities. Um, uh, we should invest more in leadership programs for dedicated to civil society, as in the past, uh, the donors were not aware about the internal needs of the NGO in the, in, in the region. Now they know that uh, investing in, in human resources in, in an NGO, in the resilience of the NGO, um, uh, in, in the programs uh, so, uh, uh, soft uh, dedicated to uh, the management of the NGO is very important in order to make the NGOs stronger and, uh, and um, uh, to uh, equip them with uh, tools to be able to to give some help to to other people also it was very important to, to invest in management it was very important to uh, discuss with the donors uh, about the uh, uh, importance to reorganize and to uh, re reorganize their priorities. It was important to discuss about transparency uh, and uh, by transparency we mean the public tenders and uh, also it was important to speak loud about the hate sp uh, speech that was um, um, that, that appeared in, uh, in, uh, in public discussions. Um, I can invite you to, to uh, read the, the policy paper, but I'll, also I will invite you to uh, follow the Civicus Monitor as they have a special uh, uh, chapter dedicated to, to the pandemic in the, in the region and you can find their uh, information from the official sources, from, uh, from the reports that are made by the civil society who were monitoring the, the situation of the NGOs in the, in the Black Sea. And uh, maybe I will uh, invite Catalin to add something about Romania and the narratives in Romania. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, I would like to, to begin my, uh, my intervention uh, by noting that uh, today we are no longer uh, talking about a division of social behavior 
between uh, East and West, but um, in, we can talk about a new wave in the social behavior. Um, the distrust, uh, the contradictory actions by, um, by the executive authorities, as well as um, a visible um, a division of the international society, um, it still remained um, elements of a source of social instability. Uh, the humanitarian COVID-19 uh, crisis is uh, providing to us that uh, the, modern, the modern state is uh, in essence a social construct unable to, unable to, um, to react uh, coherently in an exception, uh, exceptional situation. So uh, during this critical period, um, the civil society uh, carries out a key role in um, eliminating all um, all organic forms of uh, reinterpretations of objective facts, um, perceiving uh, perceiving its its educational and opinion forming uh, character uh, in the in the society. So the fundamental problems uh, naturally um, uh, arise in the highly in a highly divided society, as well as in the where the democratic element is weak or completely absent, uh, like in, uh, in Belarus. So take Romania for a typical example. Uh, Romania remains a fragile democracy today, even if uh, it's a member of the European Union and NATO. Um, the political parties have downplayed um, civil society for the past 30 years uh, and have uh, dramatically tried by any means to discredit the fundamental and innovative uh, idea of um, civic community, um, of appropriate action for the benefits of another in, um, I don't know, in um, this disinterested way. Um, I will ask you to remember now around the 2016 elections, uh, general elections and parliamentary elections in Romania, the civil society uh, was considered by the some political actors um, to be the factor of the national instability uh, because uh, the civil society and national NGOs uh, campaigned for, uh, for the defense of, uh, of the rule of law and draw attention to the fact that uh, some changes in the national legislation uh, will pave the way to, to abuse. Uh, so it's correct that decent people sincerely believe this and uh, rightly so, the televisions uh, and the media trust loyal to, uh, to the political parties um, energetically promote the anti-civil society message. And today it is extremely difficult for us to uh, measure the profound influence uh, that the civil society uh, invariably has on the, on the population, especially in the critical times. Um, now, I, uh, I would inter uh, intentionally try to, to perform a brief, uh, a brief uh, comparison with what is happening in our, uh, in our specific uh, region. Um, the civil society has been extremely vigilant and has ensured the fundamental principles of a functioning democracy are properly respected throughout the, the pandemic. Uh, whether we are talking about uh, the amount in, uh, in which states were in a state of emergency or uh, about this key period of social relaxation. So in my opinion, um, the sufficient uh, the sufficient strength and power of civil society in, combat in, in, in combating um, slippage 
and uh, the power to assume its active role in the modern country, it's extremely limited. Uh, firstly, because of the ideological uh, division at the local level and the lack of necessary um, coordination between the members of the civil society. And then because of the partnership between a part of civil society with some uh, conspirational ideas. Uh, here we can talk about uh, the ultra orthodox associations in the broadest sense uh, by the associations that uh, aggressively uh, promote traditionalism or simply by the critical part of, uh, of um, the civil society founded underground by a certain uh, interest groups. Uh, unfortunately, this can be found in countries such as Moldova, Romania, Ukraine, uh, the Russian Federation, Armenia, the Baltic states, even in Poland and Hungary. Um, and this specific element, it's the direct link between, um, between the social behavior and uh, the civil society in our region. If we were to characterize in one word uh, the situation in this pandemic period, then uh, I will use this function to characterize uh, to characterize, uh, to characterize the, um, the civil society and um, our actions. Uh, contrary to what it's, in, um, it's, it's happening in, 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 uh, in the Western Europe, my view is that uh, mobilization in the East is for one's political benefit. Uh, while in the West, we are talking about an anti um, an anti established movement, uh, a new wave of populism uh, that can be, um, can be uh, capitalized by quickly, uh, but which hasn't done uh, until now um, um, a process, a political, a political character. So, to reasonably conclude and uh, not to prolong my, my intervention too much. Uh, I feel obligated to uh, ordinarily make uh, the following clarification regarding the harmful effects of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic on, um, on public and, uh, and social health. Uh, first, um, it is logical to everyone that um, this uh, pandemic um, has put a whole human race in, in several difficulty. Uh, the engines of the modern state being um, stopped by the negative effects of this, uh, of this virus. Uh, not only physical suffering of ours, uh, of, of, of ours has, uh, has appeared, but also a moral one and unfortunately, the letter it's exploded to, to the maximum by some um, controversial groups, either for material gains or for political, uh, or for political capital. Secondly, uh, the civil society must uh, consolidate after this, uh, this critical period and um, try to fight um, try to fight both with the undemocratic political forces, which um, are trying to size as much power as possible, and with um, outlandish conspiracy theories. Here it is clear that um, we need to find the um, right tools and methods to help uh, um, the social the social order. And last, uh, lastly, I believe that we have um, an enormous responsibility uh, to identify those groups in, in the civil society that are trying to destabilize um, the society um, throughout their actions and isolate them, uh, them uh, completely. 
So um, thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, uh, I'll invite you to, to ask us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, questions, please. Well, I might uh, comment a, a little bit about, particularly about donors. Well, some, including the Black Sea Trust, responded quite early. So we got this program and uh, there have been several colleagues in different countries. Uh, also in Armenia, it's the Open Society Foundation is the most active donor in this regard and also some foreign funding including the recent call for applications from the czech assistance foundation which is dedicated to disadvantaged regions and youth from such regions and also some other vulnerable groups there are some other examples as well but uh, uh, still maybe there's a lack of coordination among the civil society institutions and other actors. So uh, till the moment, it, it hasn't been maybe very effective for us here. So we hope to be able to improve the work in this field. Uh, so I would it, like to comment on your uh, uh, yeah, thoughts, sure. uh, Armen. Uh, the the presentation of my colleague Kathleen was important for uh, to explain how a civil society in Romania was affected by the fact that uh, uh, we are missing the resources uh, for the projects and for for the initiatives, and uh, this happened after the European integration. So. For almost uh, 13 years, the, the civil society from Romania and for, from Bulgaria, and even from Greece was uh, underfunded. And um, uh, we are relying on those uh, Norwegian funds that we are receiving from time to time. I mean, from five to five years, or um, I, I don't know how they are organized, but uh, uh, the reaction of the um, donors such as uh, Black Sea uh, Trust for Regional Cooperation or Open Society Foundation mentioned by you or others, uh, other donors from the region was to evaluate quickly and to act and to support not only the civil society but also the public institutions such as police, uh, uh, such as schools uh, or uh, hospitals. So not all the amount of money dedicated usually for the civil society was redirected to civil society in order to support their action and to uh, sustain the beneficiaries of those uh, civil society actions. Uh, they wanted to act very quickly and in this regard it was much easier to uh, build uh, those partnerships with uh, with public institutions, and uh, I me I think that it is important to create awareness uh, at the level of, of the European Union. They are still researching and still monitoring the impact of the first wave, and only in the post-COVID uh, uh, time, I think they they will increase their capacity to support the real needs of the of the NGOs in the in the region. I think we will have to wait for for a couple of months or even one or two years to get the support to get the financial support of the European Union in order to improve our capabilities. I mean as a civil society. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I would like to pass the floor to Artus Bikos. Yeah, thank you, Armin, and thank you for, for organizing this uh, tremendous event and very important uh, conference. Thank you for, for, for doing that. Obviously, thank you for experts that already provided their, their opinion. Very thoughtful, very interesting. Must again thank Center for Policy Studies and, of course, ASGA for working in cooperation, I guess. And I'm actually quite assured that we are doing a very good job in that regard. So let me share you my presentation. Um, do you see it? Yes. 
Very good. So in the first conference, we were talking about the way how misinformation, disinformation, conspiracy theories about threats in Latvia. But today we are going to talk about what we are actually doing here in Latvia in order to counter it, in order to not allow disinformation, misinformation, conspiracy theories prevail in the sphere, not only in media, but in general in society. So let's first talk about the public media. And with that regard, I'm someone who is speaking with inside because I was working in public media during the first wave. So I have very, I would say, vivid experience of actually uh, describing the situation with COVID-19, not only in Latvia, but also internationally. So I'll provide some insights of how we worked. Uh, so in that portals, radio and television receive additional funding to appropriately report on COVID-19 pandemics. I wouldn't say it was billions of dollars, obviously not. But at the same time, it allowed to better cover the international regional situation, as well as to pay overtime caused by more extensive reporting. So we were reporting very extensively, especially when it came to international and regional situation. We were reporting about cases in uh, Scandinavia, in Russia, in Belarus, in Estonia and Lithuania, obviously, in Poland. All these states are very, very important to Latvia and to, and to our audience. We decided that it's very necessary for them to see how the events developed in these states. Not only that, we also provided analysis, which is something that was very popular among not only Russian speaking audience, because I was working in the Russian part of this uh, public media, but also with the Latvian speaking audience, it was very popular. And uh, what is quite important with that regard when we're talking about finding uh, misinformation, disinformation, and conspiracy theories that the Russian speaking minority in Latvia received equivalent coverage of the pandemic, including the international situation. It actually le led to the situation when a lot of people outside of Latvia, the Russian speaking people in Russia or in Belarus, were actually reading the site. So, with that regard, if you think about that, it's very good achievement. Because instead of, let's say, reading something that is not so truthful, such as Sputnik, for instance, or Russia Today, or other uh, propaganda media, they, they were reading us. And from my perspective, it's a very good achievement. So it allowed to enlarge the audience that remained after the first wave of coronavirus. Uh, in order to understand how big of an audience uh, the, Russian, uh, the Russian part of this public media achieved. It enlarged during these three months of, of the first wave, that is April, March, and May, roughly about to five times, which is an amazing result. And it's not the effect of the love of base, not at all. Uh, so with that, with that, again, tremendous, tremendous enlargement of the audience, and a lot of these people stayed which is again quite a quite a good of achievement because public media definitely uh, one of the one of the main goals of the public media is definitely to keep the audience. So the Russian speaking international audience has also grown due to the coverage of the regional situation, which is again quite an important thing. And obviously, part of the effort went into fact checking, which is again uh, was uh, one of the main goals during this situation that to report on, on, the, on the fake news, to cover them as much, as quick as possible, to provide uh, correct information and to help our audience, to guide, uh, to guide the audience in a direct and uh, correct way. That is public media. But private media and NGOs also were quite successful. Uh, Delphi and Rebaltica, these are to one, uh, Delphi is the largest uh, media uh, portal in uh, in uh, Latvia, and Rebaltica is part media, part NGO. Um, became Facebook fact checking partners exactly during the during the first wave uh, on the twenty fifth of March. So they actively flagged false information about COVID nineteen, which is also 
quite a good thing. And uh, Rebaltic in particular regularly published articles exposing misinformation, disinformation, conspiracy theories about COVID-19. And other portals also participate in fact checking. So with that regard, uh, media themselves also operated uh, quite quickly. And uh, again, in very high standards of ethics, which is again, quite an important thing. Uh, private media also receive subsidies from the state to compensate for the losses caused by the pandemic. Uh, obviously, uh, advertisers were not able to provide sufficient funds for, for the media because of the uh, lockdown, so to speak. And this helped prevent uh, a reduction in supply of information, which is very important. So imagine uh, you have, let's say, 30 to 40 mass media sources and then after the pandemic, the first wave, after three, four, five months, you're only left with 10. It's, not, it's no good in that. So with that regard, again, government did a quite, quite good job providing these subsidies to, to mass media. Government actions also were quite important with that regard. Frequent press conferences, especially in the first two, three months. Officials were explaining the actions of the government all the time. They were talking with journalists. Uh, <laughs> uh, firstly, mm -hmm. there were conference in, uh, in, uh, in the buildings of the agencies of the government, but after that, uh, via Zoom, journalists had a opportunities to ask not only just uh, officials who were, represented, who were representatives of some of the agencies res uh, responsible for fighting against COVID-19, but also Prime Minister and Minister of Health as well, which is, I guess, uh, from my perspective, quite an important thing because the higher you go, the more authority you give to this answer, which is, again, very important. You have to show that you are with, the pe with people. Uh, those who are responsible for the fight against the pandemic in, uh, in the media were also active in the media, quite active. Uh, if, 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 um, if you ask me, basically every day you were seeing someone who is responsible for that, uh, for describing the situation, who were explaining why, why we, are, why government acting in such a way, and so on and so forth, explaining the the symptoms, explaining how the COVID nineteen works, how it affects the society, how it affects everyone. This is very important. Again, explaining how. Uh, and why government acts is very important in order to uh, in order to clarify for the audience for the people for the society uh, the the actions of the government providing official information in several languages including russian and english is also very important especially yet again bearing in mind that in latvia we have quite a significant russian speaking minority and none none all of them uh, no Latvian or, or English. Thus, by providing official information in Russian, not only we do uh, help them to understand the situation and how the virus works and what they should do and should not, we're also uh, helping, helping, helping them by saving them from propaganda, from, Russia, from, from propaganda from Russia and Russian outlets close, close to Kremlin. So yet again, we're Killing, killing two rabbits with one stone, so to speak. This is quite an important thing. Uh, here is an example, for instance. Uh, you have uh, two pages in, in, in uh, Russian and Latvian, absolutely similar with the explanation of, uh, there, is, there is a particular example of when you enter or return to Latvia, what should you do? Very, very good language easy to understand how and, and how you should act, very important in order to uh, save the people from the potential spread of coronavirus. Other government actions also uh, included that other branches of the government that are not directly related to the fight against COVID-19 also countered this information. For example, the foreign minister and the minister of defense especially the Minister of Defense, for instance, in, in uh, March, one of the internet media portals uh, claimed that roughly about 20, uh, 20, uh, 20 soldiers 
in Latvian army uh, were, were ill with COVID-19 and Minister of Defense himself uh, claimed that this is false and fake news. Also, Ministry of Defense strengthened the portal Sark Salve, which is uh, the information portal of the Ministry of Defense and everything that is related to the mm -hmm. defense industry. They also were strengthening their their actions to fight the to fight the the disinformation and conspiracy theories about COVID nineteen. That is also one of the co-authors of the UN initiative to, com to combat infamedia. It was already signed by 130 countries and Latvia urged states to take measures to prevent the spread of disinformation. And these measures uh, mostly were protecting freedom of speech and press, promoting the highest ethical norms and standards, protecting journalists and other media workers, as is especially important, and promoting media literacy, trust in science, facts, national to national institutions. So, in general, as you can see, uh, from Latvian perspective, uh, these are the most important things. And President himself also was was speaking about uh, the danger that infodemia causes to the society during such a such a thing as a pandemic, and that we have to be aware of that, and we have to react and react as quickly as possible, and uh, provide necessary information for all the audience, including minorities, irregardless of the way how we do that, irregardless of the, irregardless of the language, we must do that as soon as possible, as quick as possible, and as effective as possible. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Uh, thank you, Markus. Any questions? So, uh, Arthur, in Latvia, you had like a joint response of the government structures and civil society, which probably contributed to the success in dealing with the pandemic. Yes, I would say so. Uh, you see, actually, I would claim that Latvia is one of the greatest example in, in the way how to react to COVID-19. I mean, hopefully, and we will have till, till the moment, but still we have very good numbers when it comes to COVID-19 cases and deaths and so on. And I think that one of the reasons why was exactly the cooperation with uh, the cooperation between the government and civil society and other, and other institutions, such as, for instance, uh, private media and non-governmental organizations. For instance, we are participating in this event and in this project actually doing uh, quite a good job, I believe, by showing how this information, uh, uh, how, how to fight against the disinformation, how disinformation itself presents in various regions. You see, and I, and I find this uh, very important. Arthur, thank, thank you. you for the for the presentation. Um, what will be your advice for the civil society from other countries, including in, in this project? Because you have this great cooperation between the public authorities and civil society, you are more prepared than us to face the challenges that we are coping now. And uh, if you have some uh, example of best practices promote, promoted by civil society during the pandemic, I mean to, to react, to respond, to help people in need, maybe that something can be used by, by us in Romania, in Moldova, or in South Caucasus. Thank you. Thank you, Angela, uh, very much for this question. Uh, a lot of uh, NGOs were actually helping uh, those who are in risk and vulnerable by providing them food, for instance, uh, so that they sh so that they don't have to go to the to the shops in order to buy something. They were just providing the food them to to the houses. And not only that, but also, you see, there is quite an interesting situation in one part. From, from on, the, on the one hand, you see a lot of 
conscious reaction. Understanding that COVID-19 is something to not joke about, so that we should uh, sit at home, take it as it is, work from homes, respect everyone, and respect the government decision to, to act. Uh, for instance, uh, we didn't have such a thing as anti-mask uh, marches, for instance. Yes, the sentiment is kind of there, obviously, but it's not as popular. We don't have anything close to Germany, for instance, or the United States of America. Obviously, not only in terms of numbers, it's really hard to, to, to even imagine 30,000 uh, people protest in Riga because we only have two, 2 million people living here in Latvia. But anyway, it's still really hard to imagine a protest against wearing a mask. It's really not a popular thing here. So the, the conscious idea of that we should uh, respect uh, the requirements in order to save ourselves from COVID-19 is here. And I do believe one of the reasons why is that government was quite good in their actions in terms of explaining why you should sit at home and in terms of fast reaction. I mean, we've got, again, if I'm not mistaken, roughly about four cases and we basically said we are basically closing the country. So st stopping schools, stopping universities. For instance, I was, I was uh, a lecturer. It was, it, it was my first course, uh, full, 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 full course. I was a lecturer and I was amazed how, qu how quick uh, university was to react, to stop, the, to stop the lectures and just moving to Zoom. Very fast. I was amazed uh, in a way that how, how, how quick the reaction was. And everyone accepted it. I mean, students were participating in Zoom lectures, Zoom seminars, everything was fine. So you see this fast reaction, the explanation from the government, how we how should react and why we are doing that, why COVID-19 is such a dangerous thing. It's very important, the strategic communication, it was concise and it was logical. You can understand why it was that. Obviously, there were people that disagreed with, uh, with, this, with this sentiment. And we showed you that there was disinformation, there was misinformation, but nothing, nothing similar to something that is happening in Central Europe, for instance. And I guess that this strategic communication, the understanding of how we should communicate with the society, uh, picking up, picking, picking, let's say, three, four key people who are dealing with this communication, who are dealing with the COVID-19, who are very, again, concise and logical with their, uh, with their message is, is absolutely crucial. Imagine you have three, four, five people who are saying all the time different stuff. Someone is saying that we should protect ourselves and sit at home. Someone is saying that masks are not relevant and you, should, and, and you must, and you must uh, go to your job every day. The third one doesn't know anything at all. And you are sitting here and trying to understand what, who, who should I follow in that regard. On the other hand, when you have the strategic communication, you have three, four people, and especially the less people you have, the better, obviously, because it's easier to manage that. But uh, three, four key, key persons who are directing this communication, who are explaining why and how you should act is very important with that regard. And then society will understand, most of it at least, Yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, we will now probably have to wrap up. So, if anybody would like to make some final remarks, we may go for that. Just one small and final remarks. Uh, compared with your case, uh, in our region, we were deprived by strategy and communication from from the from the governments, and I think this was the the biggest mistake. And uh, we can uh, rely on civil society. We can rely on ourselves, but uh, uh, without the support of the of the authorities, without uh, them being an example for the society. Uh, we cannot uh, uh, 
fight against the COVID-19 thing. Thank you. And thank you for the presentation. By the way, it means a lot to see how the other countries can, can manage to, uh, to organize themselves in, in a such way. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, I may say in Armenia, we also haven't had very effective communication. The authorities' response was somehow reactive, not proactive, I would say. Uh, at the same time, a lot of apparently well-funded uh, disinformation sources appeared from the very beginning. One, probably I mentioned it before, at least uh, in an article, if not in a presentation at the previous event, one of them even managed to get this US Democracy Commission grant for developing the website and then turned that website into a disinformation source about vaccinations. And it was exposed by the Open Democracy website a few months ago. So uh, there are several narratives, also some repeated ones about Soros, about Bill Gates. Also, so Bill Gates is accused of sponsoring some faulty vaccines not developed yet, but still, and uh, there are these narratives about 5G, etc. So it's very little of such uh, narratives is produced locally, as we can see here. So hopefully we can improve our communication and also engage partners from across the civil society and also public institutions and to change the situation. Well, recently, the situation in Armenia has been less tense than in summer because in August, in early September, we already had much fewer cases, but then after sending children to school from the 14th of September, we see that the number of cases has been growing again. Also with uh, students uh, starting uh, attending classes a few days even before that. So uh, hopefully we can uh, keep the society well informed and prevent a new spread of the infection as the, the autumn and the winter, it may be even worse than summer. So uh, thank you very much again for your uh, presentations and your inputs. Uh, we'll, of course, try to take some useful points into consideration in our publications and in uh, the, our recommendations as we'll be trying to shape some public policies. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to getting also some articles from you. So thank you very much, and uh, I hope we may schedule a new event soon. In a few days, it should be clear already. Uh, and I hope more audience will join us next time as well. So thank you very much. Have a nice evening. And see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.